All right, uh, welcome back. It is actually time for another one of my oh-so-exciting monthly garden check-ins, walkthroughs, and I'm actually starting this one off with what I'm calling my three failures this year, um, or eh, I guess you'd call it two failures and uh, a partial failure. So first off is the Seminole Pumpkins. Uh, these are a disappointment, and it's all my fault. I flew too close to the sun, and I thought that I could cram, I don't know, about 10 plants into a 6 foot by 6 foot raised bed, and that if I just feed them enough, it'll be uh, all good, and they'll produce tons of little pumpkins, and we'd be swimming in them. But that is not what happened. Instead, there are a t grand total, and all out of all this greenery, a grand total of two. One, this one here about the size of a softball and an even smaller one along the fence line here maybe the size of a baseball and i'm kind of deciding if i'm going to make a hard call here and um, uh, this is an awful lot of space uh, to be taken up for a total of two squash so um, let's see what Maybe, maybe I pull these and do something different. We'll see. Failure number two, my asparagus beans. Uh, we typically plant these as a hot weather alternative to uh, green beans. Uh, in, uh, most uh, species or rather varieties of, of uh, green string beans just don't do well in the heat. Asparagus beans, however, taste very similar, delicious, and they're very heat tolerant. Unfortunately, I f the failure that I made or the failure that occurred here, I didn't realize that these half barrels that I have set up along the uh, southern fence line of my yard here just doesn't get a lot of sunshine, especially in the early season. And these are a very sun-loving plant. Um, also, being admittedly back here, kind of out of sight, out of mind, they're a little more neglected than they should have been. Not didn't get a whole lot off of these, and they look like they're just about done. Um, you know, we got a, we got a couple of dinners with beans as a side, but in prior years, again, these were are typically a very high production kind of plant. Um, but this year it was not to be. I'm not too worried. Um, I'm going to in a couple of weeks here actually plant uh, some standard green beans. Just you know one of the more common varieties and uh, grow those into the early fall. There are most speed or most uh, varieties of green beans are pretty uh, uh, quick yield. So we should be able to get some in uh, before the, uh, the frost, the first frost, which usually, usually happens in November. I consider all of our hot peppers to be a partial failure this year. And I don't know why, but we really struggle with hot peppers. They don't, they rarely actually turn out hot, um, and I'm just not sure what we're doing. Uh, some sources say that if you overwater them, uh, you know that they the, the more stressed the plant is, the hotter the pepper will be. Or um, you know, if the soil is actually too fertile, I don't know. I've grown hot peppers. Some of them have been babied and gotten plenty of water. Others have. Uh, you know, kind of been neglected and were under all kinds of stress where the plant repeatedly wilted and the peppers just still weren't very hot. I have some cayennes, which are kind of sporadically hot. Let me see if I can get, yeah, there's one there. Um, so the, some of these are hot, some aren't. I mostly, I'm, I'm just drying everything that I pick and grinding it into a powder, which is turning out to be at least somewhat spicy, which is okay. I'm not exactly a heavyweight when it comes to hot peppers. Uh, but still, if I grow something that's supposed to be really hot, that's what I want it to be. Uh, the serranos are actually these serranos. Get one here. The shadowing is making things difficult. But um, these are actually my hottest peppers this year, which they're known for being kind of hotter than a jalapeno, but again, not really a super hot. Um, I would say that these are turning out to be largely as hot as a standard jalapeno pepper. Moving over here, so these are my Thai chili peppers, which are starting to ripen up. And again, huge disappointment. These are supposed to be um, 
between 50,000 and 100,000 Scoville heat units, and they taste like nothing. In fact, what I'm going to do here is I'm going to pick one. And just to provide some context, I am kind of a lightweight when it comes to spicy food. Uh, your standard buffalo chicken wings are about, about as spicy as I can, you know, comfortably handle. So watch this. Sorry, here you go. I'll have to look at me here for a minute. I'm trying to find the, where the camera is to make it look like I'm looking at people. So here is a Thai chili. Again, should be between 50,000 and 100,000 Scoville heat units. So doing this right here should put me out of action for like half an hour. Nothing. Tastes almost kind of sweet, like a, um, a mini um, well-ripened bell pepper. No heat whatsoever. So that's actually, this is kind of a disappointment. Um, again, I wouldn't make something heavily Thai chili pepper flavored, but you know, they're great because in previous years when I have had them hot, I can like drop one into a whole pot of chili and, and that's, that's good enough. So not really sure what I'm doing wrong with my peppers. Again, this has been about three seasons in a row where they've been just mild, um, at least I'm getting a little bit of spice out of my cayennes and um, my uh, serrano peppers. But what I'm hoping is that as this, there's a ghost pepper plant right next to that Thai chili. So hopefully at least that one turns out to be actually hot. All right, on to some stuff that actually that is doing well. I'm um, starting with this here. Volunteer mystery winter squash plant. I call it a mystery winter squash because it is um, a... The result of a cross-pollination of some kind um, between uh, the squashes that I had going last year and I thought I've actually harvested one developed squash off of this and I'll get to that in a moment um, it had ripened and then it was actually starting to rot a little bit around the stem and I, um, I harvested it and processed it real quick because uh, I wanted to you know get some some food out of it uh, I thought that this was going to be just a one and done, but it had the plant actually got kind of a second wind all of a sudden in the last couple of weeks um, after, you know, almost no female flowers um, developing and starting to mature, it really took off and suddenly there's a whole bunch on it that look like they're actually going to make it. Uh, this is surprising right here. This one is well on its way. And I just noticed it, um, that it even existed oh, maybe two weeks ago. So this is growing fast. There's, oh, here's another one down here in my failed asparagus beans. Uh, I'll take it. More calories in squash than in uh, beans, as though, as though I need more calories. <laughs> but um, cooked right winter squash is absolutely delicious. All right, as you can see here, I harvested uh, one of those kind of weird looking hybrid squash um, off that volunteer plant next to the compost bin. Um, I don't know what this is a, a hybrid of. Um, we grew last year largely Maxima um, in the form of Hubbard squash, Cucurbita Maxima, and um, some Cucurbita Machada um, in the form of uh, Muscade de Provence. I'm probably butchering that pronunciation. Um, pumpkins, Muscade de Provence. Um, I, I only got C's in high school French, I'll put it that way. Um, anyway, unfortunately, I had to harvest this one. I would have left it on the vine a little longer, but it started developing this rot spot here. And I'm hoping that I can get, you know, at least a little bit of usable um, uh, food out of this. But I want to take a quick look at this. This is weird because it almost looks like, based on the color, the striping, and the green spot at the bottom, this looks like a giant um, golden nugget squash, but um, according to my seed package, the golden nugget squashes are uh, Cucurbita pepo, which is, you know, um, what your uh, zucchini will be um, and your acorn squash will be. So it shouldn't have hybridized with anything else uh, that we were growing last year in terms of winter squash. Um, if that was a hybrid of a, say, a zucchini that we grew and a golden nugget squash, I would expect this to be some kind of weird-looking summer squash, winter squash, 
cross that I'd probably want nothing to do with. Anyway, I'm going to cut this open both to see how, um, you know, if this, how deep this rot goes and if there's anything salvageable inside. Hopefully it's just something that can be cut out of the way so we can still use it. Um, I'm also curious what the, uh, the interior flesh looks like. All right, so let's split this guy open here. So go right down the middle. Ah, it's small enough that with a little effort, oh, well, I should be able to get this right in half. Through there and there. What do we have? All right, it's a... Not a deep orange, but definitely a yellow orange kind of a flesh. Um, and it looks like looks like that rot is pretty superficial, so I can get rid of that and um, go from there. So, huh, big seeds. All right, so um, after cutting that squash open, I did a little uh, extra research. And it turns out that gold nugget squash actually are um, a maxima. And that's in spite of what it says here on my um, gold nugget squash seeds. So these are the all of the uh, three varieties of winter squash that I had going last year. Um, all three are maximas. So judging by the, the shape um, of the sweet meat combined with the coloration of the gold nugget. So my best guess is that it's a cross between those two, which it's actually really kind of cool. Um, I roasted that squash down and it's pretty good. Um, a very dry texture, which is great for a lot of applications, not stringy like uh, some uh, winter squash can be, uh, and, and pretty sweet too. So I think it'll be a pretty good, um, you know, general purpose winter squash, soups, stews, pastries, all that kind of stuff. Also on the topic of winter squash, uh, my butterbush are doing really well, They're ripening on the vine right now bunch of these ah I don't know I've got between all my plants I've got four plants let's say uh, probably close to 10 fruits of varying size and I'm really starting to come to like the um, the handful of bush variety winter squash these are uh, offered by burpee they're butter bush um, and as you can see they're just a kind of scaled down um, butternut squash and while the, each plant, the yield is way lower than the typical out of control binding squashes, um, they take up less space. And here in uh, Sacramento, uh, zone 9B, we actually, because they yield so quick, we have time if we want to do two rounds. Uh, so your per plant yield, yield of squash will be lower than with the binding uh, out of control squashes, but um, you can do more plants in the same amount of time. So in a way it kind of evens out and, and you know, honestly, as much as I do love winter squash, uh, it's one of those things that a, a family can only eat so much of. And here's a surprise. Uh, my Boston pickling cucumbers are still producing into, here we are at the end of the second week of August. Yeah, that's I've never had cucumbers, you know, standard variety cucumbers survive this long into the season. That one is too far. I missed it. It's starting to turn yellow. Uh, usually uh, letting a, a cucumber go so long it turns yellow, that is the end of the plant. Um, it's a fully mature fruit. And uh, what I've read and heard and watched is once it, um, once there's a mature fruit, the plant considers that its job is done and it will die off. I don't know that it will because I've, I've picked a few more, a few other yellow ones and these keep going. Though I have to admit, I don't necessarily care at this point. Um, I'm getting burned out on making pickles. Uh, I've made a lot of pickles this year and it's starting to get a little tedious. It's a weird thing to complain about, you know, complaining about success, but apparently garden burnout is not uncommon um, among people with larger gardens, especially this time of year. Likewise, our Armenian cucumber plant is still producing. It's, um, as I pointed out in my last video, it's coming kind of to the end of its, um, you know, productive lifespan, but there's still a few on here. Oh, there's a good one right there. Better pick that before it gets much bigger. This is about, about perfect for an Armenian cucumber.
Um, and I'm leaving these here. Th these uh, beds with the trellis here, uh, this is where I'm going to plant um, a fall crop of uh, green beans in one bed, and I'm going to do a, um, a fast yielding cucumber variety in the other to try to, you know, keep kind of keep uh, salad veggies going into the fall would be kind of nice. Um, at some point, the goal would be to actually have a whole complete garden salad with stuff that we grew. Um, what throws it off is greens. So uh, here again in Sacramento, uh, things like lettuce and spinach, um, they don't survive through the hot summer. So we get, when we're getting plenty of tomatoes for salads, we have to buy lettuce. Um, in the winter, when we're getting plenty of lettuce, we have to buy tomatoes. So I'm trying to figure something out to at some point do an entire garden salad with stuff we grew here. I've got a handful of Shoshito pepper plants here. And these turned red. I know that they're usually harvested yellow. Uh, I actually, I just prefer the sweeter taste of peppers that have gone red. Um, so I, I let things go a little longer. Um, but these, I'm probably going to pick these. We're, we're doing a, um, a garden veggie pizza tonight, and I'm going to harvest some of these in a moment to uh, put on that. Also, our bell peppers are doing well. There's some end rot and some sun scald on a couple of them, uh, but for the most part, they're, they're coming right along, producing steadily. You can see a lot of them. Again, I'm letting them go to turn red, like these ones here will be ready in a, in a couple of days. Might do a, um, put these into a, uh, an upcoming and do my first round of uh, jarred salsa. Um, and, um, that calls for quite a bit of bell pepper. And uh, this is actually, I think, the first year that we can, won't have to buy quite as many to do the salsa. All right, I'm doing tomatoes last because there's a lot to say on them. And also, uh, I'm again kind of getting, actually, a little burned out on dealing with uh, tomatoes. Um, obviously, you know, I'm happy that, uh, you know, we're getting these, um, but it, it's, it's a lot of processing and a lot of, you know, we freeze them before we can them in a lot of cases. So uh, bagging and freezing and then ultimately canning and processing which is tedious. Uh, it's worth enduring because in the middle of the winter, you know, you can grab a can of fresh um, marinara sauce or uh, salsa, and that that's that makes it all worth it. Um, these are these San Marzanos here are still giving. Um, I've lost track. I, I have written down, of course, but um, you know, we're I don't know exactly uh, how many pounds of San Marzanos we've um, picked so far. But across all varieties of tomato um, so far this summer, we are now sitting somewhere between 150 and 200 pounds. Um, and I know that that seems probably on the surface like a lot for a small garden, but most of these are sauce tomatoes. And as anybody who knows anything about canning can tell you, like 25 pounds of sauce tomatoes will re reduce down to like two quarts of sauce. Yeah, it's a little hyperbolic, but you get the point that, you know, these don't go as far as you think they would go. Um, considering doing a future video on, you know, how we preserve our tomatoes and other things, uh, but there's already just so much content, you know, out there on canning and preserving. Um, I'm not sure if it's, you know, worth everybody's time. I'll, I'll consider it, though. Um, on to my Rio Grands, which were an amazing producer this year. Uh, it was the first year growing this variety, and I'm really glad we did determine it. Um, and these, as you can see, they've kind of done what they're going to do. Um, there's a few straggling ripening ones on the vine here. I don't know if some of these smaller ones are if they're going to get any bigger. Uh, but uh, I'll, I'll leave them, you know, I'll let them go for another week or two and see if there's any change. If not, I would kind of like them to finish up here so I can reclaim this bed space. Uh, for other things, but I'm not going to, you know, some things kind of obviously can't be rushed. Very happy with uh, the Cherokee purples this year. We have a total of four plants. Uh, there's two of them right here. Um, and again, I, I haven't added up exactly how many pounds um, 
we uh, picked off of our, it's actually five plants off of our five Cherokee purple plants, but it's, it's a lot. And as you can see, some of these guys got big, you know, about the size of my kid's head. Um, and what we don't eat with these, I dry on the food dehydrator and I um, then grind them into a powder. I'm a huge fan of uh, tomato powders for thickening various soup, stew, and chili bases. Um, also, you know, you can incorporate it into like a, a dry barbecue rub. Really good stuff. Um, recently, I actually learned um, very late in the gardening game, and I didn't realize that it was common knowledge um, that it, you can pick basically as soon as the tomato um, reaches the color break point, um, you can pick them to ripen inside. Um, and that tomatoes have a, a very narrow optimal ripening temperature window, which we are almost always um, above uh, at this time of year. So um, they actually ripen faster inside. And some of them, if you leave them on the vine in incredibly hot temperatures, uh, they'll stall out. I think, I think the, if I remember correctly, the optimal temperature is in the uh, mid 80s Fahrenheit for daytime temps. So I've been um, picking a lot of them um, under ripe and letting them ripen up on my grow light rack inside. The lights are off. Um, it's another myth that I was taught growing up was that you know you you leave your under ripe tomatoes in a sunny window and it helps them ripen faster when it turns out that it, sunlight doesn't help them ripen at all. Um, and I know that a lot of people, you know, tout the flavor of a vine ripened tomato as, you know, superior. Um, I honestly, I, you know, maybe I just have a garbage palate, but I can't taste the difference between a vine ripened um, tomato and a tomato that's allowed to reach peak ripeness off the vine. Um, maybe some people can, I'm um, not going to argue with it, but um, the other thing that I like about picking the tomatoes under ripe is... Um, I love a perfectly ripened tomato, and so does every other bug and critter in a 50-mile radius. So, you know, you can get them inside where they're safe um, before they hit peak ripeness, and it reduces pest pressure. All right. Cherry tomatoes, um, like the Rio Grandes, uh, these are just about done doing what they're going to do. Yeah, they're an indeterminate, and technically indeterminates can grow forever, but, um, you know... Everything does have a lifespan. Um, a few stragglers we're leaving on the vine here. But, um, you know, again, I, I expect this to be pretty much done in the next two, maybe three weeks. If we make it into early September, picking some of these that haven't ripened yet, that'll be great. Um, this is one of my round two tomatoes, uh, an ex another experimental variety. It's a dwarf cherry variety um, called... Uh, uh, patio. They just called it patio, uh, offered by a uh, uh, seed company, Botanical Interests. Um, I'm seeing how that goes. This is kind of an experiment. Um, what I'm hoping is that, as I was talking about with really wanting fully fresh salads from our gardens at some point, um, is I'm going to see if I can grow a couple of these over the winter with, you know, a system of frost covers keeping it next to our uh, 1950s era house, which just hemorrhages heat, you know, on, on the sunny patio. Maybe, you know, we can have uh, garden fresh greens and garden fresh tomatoes for a change. Um, so I'll let everybody know how that little experiment goes. And here are a couple more of my round two tomatoes, which um, I started these indoors under grow lights in June. This is an aroma. Um, I know I'm, I'm just complained about how I'm tired of processing tomatoes, yet I grew a whole second round of, you know, an almost uh, 20, 20 new plants that I started in June. And I've been kind of sticking them in um, spaces in the beds as other plants kind of finish doing what they're doing. Um, but this is already starting to form new fruits and so far no blossom end rot. Um, I'm trying an experiment with a foliar spray of a fertilizer called calcium uh, nitrate. Um, and I've read that if you apply that to the fruits as they're forming periodically, it can greatly reduce blossom end rot, which I'm hoping that I can do for, for this variety um, because the super blossom end rot prone, but um, the fruits that we did get were amazing. 
Uh, you know, a lot of them were bigger than any of our uh, San Marzano's, which is really cool. So again, I'm, that's another thing I'm trying that I am going to kind of update and keep everybody posted on to see if it's a worthwhile thing. Technically not organic. I'm not super crazy about using any inorganic fertilizers, um, but uh, I'm not applying it to the soil. So, you know, it's not really going to be affecting my soil biology, which is nice. And, you know, or organic is great, but when you're already working with a small amount of uh, plants, sometimes you do what you have to within reason, you know, I'm not going to do anything that's massively environmentally destructive or unethical, but uh, I'm not going to stick hard to purely organic, um, you know, if it's not hurting anything else really. So I will uh, keep updates and see how my second round uh, tomato experiment is going, uh, or kind of update anybody who might be interested on that. Really want to take advantage of um, the year-round growing season to whatever degree here. That's It's easy to just complain about, you know, when you live in a place like the Sacramento Valley or other really hot, dry places with really rough summers, just to, to only focus on the heat and complain about that. But one of the upsides is I can grow stuff year-round. Um, I don't even need to start our broccoli until October. It's frost tolerant enough. We had um, broccoli all winter long last year. Um, and it, you know, it endured every frost that we had. We have frosts, but they're not like crazy hard frosts like, you know, you'll get where I grew up in New England. So i um, kind of excited about that this year. Uh, anyway, if anybody's still tuning in uh, and still watching, I appreciate it.